Good morning, grantees. Thank you all for joining the webinar today. Before we begin, please select the mute function on your computers or phones to avoid background noise. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the webinar. Please jot down your questions during the presentation or submit your questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen and we'll answer them in order they are, they are received at the end of the presentation. My name is Abby Newman and I'm a California Sea Grant Fellow at State Lands Commission. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Rick Bogiano and um, a public land management specialist at the commission and Merrick Farnham, an environmental scientist here at the commission. I'm also joined by four of our agency partners, Flower Moy, a Sea Grant Fellow at the State Controller's Office, Tina Huang, uh, the Climate Change Program Manager at the Ocean Protect Protection Council, Eric Martinez, a Sea Grant Fellow at California Coastal Commission, Carrie Boyle, a Sea Grant Fellow at the State Coastal Conservancy, and Jackie Mandowski, a Sea Grant Fellow at the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Before we dive into the webinar and a few housekeeping items, we're recording the webinar and we'll post the recording on our AB691 webpage in the next week or so, along with today's slides. I will be sure to send out a link out once it's posted. We'll be hosting another webinar in late August, which will be designed to give grantees an opportunity to discuss their challenges and work through solutions with other grantees in an open dialogue facilitated by the commission staff and our agency partners. For today's webinar, I will quickly review the AB 691 legislation. Tina will walk us through the Ocean Protection Council's updated sea level rise guidance released at the beginning of this year. The presentation will then follow our four assessment criteria. Under assessment criteria number one, Flower and Eric will discuss the process for assessing sea level rise impacts and identifying important assets and risks. For number two, Jackie will review some of the mapping tools available to assess sea level rise. For number three, Merritt and Carrie will discuss estimating the financial cost of sea level rise impacts and identify various adaptation strategies. And for number four, I will discuss some important considerations to keep in mind with your assessments and identify some of the other sea level rise assessments or plans that may satisfy components of your AB 691 submission. We will then walk walk you through some recently added resources to our website and leave you with our contact information while we take questions. For a brief overview of the AB 691 legislation, this piece of legislation was passed on October 5th, 2013. The bill requires trustees of granted lands with average annual gross public trust revenues exceeding 250,000 to submit a sea level rise adaptation strategy assessment to the commission by July 1st, 2019. Once we receive these assessments, we are required to make them available to the public on our website and send electronic copies to certain, certain public entities. Tina will now discuss the updated OPC sea level rise guidance. Great, so I'm going to talk about the 2018 update to the State of California Sea Level Rise Guidance, which was adopted by the Ocean Protection Council this year. Uh, so the new guidance provides a methodology for state and local governments to analyze and assess the risks associated with sea level rise and to incorporate sea level rise into their planning, permitting, and investment decisions. This is an update to the previous version of the the sea level rise guidance, which was from 2013 and was based on a 2012 study from the National Research Council. Um, this new guidance is based on a 2017 science report known as the Rising Seas Report, uh, which is considered by the state to be the best available science um, on sea level rise for California. The guidance generally has four components. First of all, it has a synthesis of the best available science and projections for 12 uh, tide gauges along the California coast. Second, it provides a step-by-step -step approach for selecting sea level rise projections. Third, it gives uh, preferred uh, coastal adaptation approaches. And then finally, it provides a description of a suite of sea level rise mapping tools and resources. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, 
Sorry, Tanya, we're just having a little technical difficulty here. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, as I mentioned, the guidance provides projections for 12 tide gauges along the California coast. And here's an example of what the projections look like for the tide gauge in San Francisco. Uh, so, in contrast to the previous guidance, um, here you'll see that the sea level rise projections have probabilities associated with them. And I'll walk you through uh, briefly how to read this table. So in the first column, we have years starting from 2030 going to 2150. Um, for years 2050 and beyond, there are sea level rise projections based on a high and low greenhouse gas emission scenarios. The high emission scenario is based um, is the business as usual trajectory, whereas the low emission scenario reflects um, California's greenhouse gas reduction efforts. Uh, for each year, as you go across the row, you can find sea level rise projections um, based on a probability of occurrence. So for example, in the column that says um, likely range at the top, uh, there's a 66% probability that sea level rise will be between the two numbers in this column. In the next column, over to the right, there is a 5% probability that sea level rise will meet or exceed that amount. And then one more column over, there is a 0.5% probability that sea level rise will meet or exceed that amount. And then in the far right column is the sea level rise projection for an extreme um, sea level rise scenario, um, which is known as the H++ scenario. But this um, scenario doesn't have a probability associated with it. Next, you'll see that um, there are dark blue boxes around three of these columns where it says low risk aversion, medium high risk aversion, and extreme risk aversion. Um, and these can be thought of as guide rails for deciding what sea level rise projection to use in your planning based on uh, your level of risk aversion. And the guidance uh, provides an example of a decision framework to use to help you determine um, what your level of risk aversion is for whatever you're looking at. Next slide. So here is a summary of the step-by-step -step process for selecting sea level rise projections to evaluate risk and to incorporate into decisions. So step one is to identify the nearest tide gauge to your project or area of interest. Step two is to determine the lifespan for the thing you want to evaluate. For step three, um, based on your life on the lifespan, identify a range of sea level rise projections, um, which you can find in the tables provided in the guidance. And then for step four, you evaluate the vulnerability uh, using the range of projections. Um, and then step five, you select the projections that you'll be using for planning or project design. Uh, the guidance also introduces the idea of adaptation pathways, which involves phasing short and long-term uh, adaptation strategies over time. Um, this makes use of um, observing threshold events that would trigger subsequent adaptation phases, either planning or implementation. Um, threshold events could be, for example, a certain amount of sea level rise, observed overtopping, or an increase in flood frequency. And this approach helps to address uncertainty associated with the sea level rise projection probabilities. Um, and this process of selecting sea level rise projections is similar or complementary to what's found in the Coastal Commission's um, sea level rise policy guidance. And the Coastal Commission is um, currently in the process of integrating the Ocean Protection Council's guidance into its own guidance. Next slide. Uh, the guidance also provides uh, recommendations for preferred sea level rise planning and adaptation approaches. I won't go into depth here, but uh, generally the recommendations um, cover social equity, coastal habitats, and public access, um, the unique considerations for uh, water-dependent infrastructure, public trust uses, um, and ports. Um, it also covers um, acute increases in sea level rise, cross-jurisdictional coordination, community and regional planning, uh, local, local conditions, and adaptive capacity. Next slide. 
Uh, finally, the guidance describes several sea level rise mapping tools. Uh, Jackie will talk about a few of these more later and more resources will be available at the end of the presentation. But I do want to point out the Adaptation Clearinghouse website, which was recently released. Um, it's a repository of adaptation planning documents, guidance, mapping tools, and other resources with many items on sea level rise. And so that website is resilientca.org. Next slide. This is Flower Moy from the State Controller's Office. And now we'd like to walk you through the four components of the AB 691 submission criteria. Those components are the assessment of sea level rise impacts, maps of the granted lands with projected sea levels during 2030, 2050, and 2100, estimates of the financial costs associated with sea level rise, and finally, the actual proposal, a description of how resources and structures will be protected and preserved from the impacts of sea level rise. And starting with the first step, the first thing to do is create an inventory of your assets. These assets should include both natural and human-made resources and facilities. Then consider the sea level rise impacts on these assets based on your local conditions and trends which could include, but are not limited to, extreme weather events and changing shorelines due to storm surges, waves, and erosion. It is important to also include these considerations on public trust resources. With your completed inventory and a better understanding of the possible sea level rise impacts on your assets, prioritize the vulnerabilities to be addressed. Your prioritization may be based on financial constraints, time, or public health and safety concerns. Hi, this is Eric from the Coastal Commission. And in order to understand how coastal hazards will impact coastal communities and to eventually identify appropriate adaptation responses, you must first have a good understanding of what assets you are dealing with and the risks associated. Um, assets can generally be classified as built or natural resources. Built assets could include things such as homes, airports, ground transportation, wastewater treatment plants, and stormwater drainage systems. These are all critical infrastructures that could suffer structural damage by sea level rise impacts such as flooding, inundation, extreme waves that increase bluff erosion. Low-lying roads and wastewater treatment facilities, energy facilities, stormwater infrastructure and utility infrastructure such as potable water systems and electricity transfer systems are at risk of impaired function as well, which would not just impact communities near the coast but also inland communities that depend on these resources. In terms of ports and harbors, both industrial and recreational, Sea level rise could cause a variety of impacts, including flooding and inundation of port infrastructure and damage to piers and marina facilities from wave action and higher water levels. Increased water heights could reduce bridge clearance, reducing the size of ships that can access ports or restricting movement of ships to low tides, and potentially increasing throughput times for cargo delivered to ports, which could have serious economic implications for California and the nation. Additionally, the inundation of contaminated lands and other assets near industrial development could lead to problems with water quality and polluted runoff due to leaking storage tanks, increases in non-point source pollution, and saltwater intrusion. On the other hand, natural resource assets include beaches, dunes, intertidal areas, and wetlands, which are vulnerable to inundation and decreased, increased erosion from sea level rise. These impacts could result in, in the conversion of habitat from one type to another and generally reduce the amount of nearshore habitat, such as, this, such as sandy beaches and rocky intertidal areas. Sea level rise will cause landward migration of beaches over the long term and could lead to a rapid increase in the retreat, of, retreat rate of dunes. While shoreline protective devices do exist, these alter natural shorelines and also generally have negative impacts on beaches, nearshore marine habitat, and scenic and visual qualities of the coastal area of coastal areas. Sea level rise could also lead to a loss of public access and recreation opportunities due to permanent inundation, episodic flooding, and erosion of beaches, recreational areas, and trails. Many of these consequences are conditions that coastal managers are already, already deal with on a regular basis, and strategies already exist for minimizing impacts from flooding, inundation, erosion, and saltwater intrusion. Preparing for sea level rise involves integrating future projections of sea levels into existing hazard analysis and planning practices. 
Luckily, there are a variety of tools that are available to help you figure out where these impacts will happen, and Jackie Mendowski will cover some of these tools. Hi, I'm Jackie Mandoski at the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, and I will walk you through some online tools available to help you develop maps for sea level rise to meet criteria two of AB 691. Next slide, please. There are various mapping tools out there, uh, only some of which are included here, and these tools may differ in what methods they use, how they choose to display that data, and what specific coastal processes they include, among other components. I'll briefly describe a few of these tools listed here. Next slide, please. So the top two tools, the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer and Climate Central's Surging Sea Risk Finder provide sea level rise data modeled nationally, but can be used locally. The NOAA Digital Coast Sea Level Rise Viewer uses the highest accuracy elevation data set and models flooding from high tides and sea level rise up to six feet. It includes layers for marsh distribution and wetland type, social vulnerability, and a few others. A limitation is that this viewer does not include storm surge, erosion, or other coastal processes. The Surging Seas Risk Finder complements the NOAA viewer and displays flooding from sea level rise up to 10 feet and also includes storm surge. Additionally, this tool allows users to analyze over 100 other socio-demographic and environmental variables at risk from sea level rise. While this model does include storm events, it is important to note that the intervals here are based on historical reconstructions and do not account for future climate-related changes in storm frequencies. This tool also does not include erosion. An example of the surging seas viewer can be seen on this slide here on your right. Next slide, please. These bottom two tools are more specific to the California coastline and the San Francisco Bay. The top one, Our Coast, Our Future, or OCOF, web viewer displays data from a model called COSMOS, the Coastal Storm Modeling System, developed by the U.S. Geological Survey. This model accounts for physical structures, wave dynamics, coastal erosion, and other hydrodynamical factors. The viewer includes layers for flooding, waves, currents, duration, and flood potential. It allows users to choose from, a sea level, from sea level rise amounts up to 16 feet in combination with storm scenarios at an annual 20-year or 100-year storm, as well as San Francisco Bay-specific king tides. A benefit of this model is that it incorporates atmospheric conditions from global climate models, affecting vulnerability both now and into the future. Lastly is the Adapting to Rising Tides, or ART, Bay Area Flood Explorer which will be available online in an interactive website, July 2018. And this tool features uh, unique flood maps uh, suited specifically for adaptation planning in the San Francisco Bay. This is because these maps have undergone in intensive stakeholder review to ground truth topographic data. This tool displays the one map many futures approach, where a single total water level reflects a variety of sea level rise and storm surge combinations, and can be better used to understand individual or combined flood risk. It displays sea level rise up to nine feet and various storm surge frequencies. Another unique feature of this tool is its overtopping analysis, which shows where on the shoreline floodwaters move inland, which can be used to help inform adaptation. For instance, in the Oakland example to your right, flooding occurs at a total water level of 36 inches, and the overtopping data uh, illustrates where waters are likely to be entering, uh, shown on this slide in those green circles, and this can be used to help prioritize and target adaptation planning efforts. So the variety of mapping tools reflect different approaches to modeling the different components of sea level rise, storm surge, and other coastal processes. It's important to understand what each model does and does not show so that you know if additional analysis may be necessary. Choosing which viewer or model to use may depend on your location or specific needs. More information on where to find these tools will be described later in this talk. So, thanks Jackie. This is Marin Farnham from the State Lands Commission, and I'll review uh, the criteria for estimating the financial costs of sea level rise. Estimating the financial costs of sea level rise is intended to help the grantee prioritize adaptation strategies and effectively plan for adaptation implementation. Following the reception of all AB 691 submissions, 
the State Lands Commission intends to evaluate the cost estimate information provided and make recommendations to the state for developing targeted financing assistance programs to support local needs for implementation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, th there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach for estimating the costs. We understand that it may be very difficult to provide complete quantitative financial cost estimates due to a variety of factors, but every grantee does still need to address this requirement. Informed quantitative estimates are the most useful for the state's purposes, but qualitative estimates may be the appropriate measure for a grantee, depending on the circumstances. What we do ask is that you take the time to describe your methodology so that the commission understands why a particular valuation approach was chosen. The following are examples of valuation methods that could be used by a grantee to begin scoping the costs of sea level rise impacts and adaptation strategies. We would like information to help us understand both the costs associated with impacts to assets and adaptation strategies selected by grantees to mitigate for those impacts and build greater resiliency for public trust assets. There may also be market and non-market economic opportunities and benefits associated with certain adaptation approaches, and we'd like to encourage grantees to consider these as well. In order to better understand the value of vulnerable assets and what is at stake, the grantee could calculate the replacement costs of the asset. This could be appropriate for the highest priority assets that are the most vulnerable to sea level rise and likeliest to lose their functionality or placement due to sea level rise impacts. An example of an asset that could be a good fit for this type of valuation would be a pier or a wharf. If you are unfamiliar with how to calculate the replacement costs of an asset, we can provide resources and information to help. The calculation involves calculating the capital and operational costs of an asset over its lifetime, factoring in depreciation based on the market value and a chosen social discount rate. We would also encourage valuing non-market assets, such as recreational values and other types of ecosystem services like storm protection value or primary productivity. This way we will understand better the financial costs associated with the loss of critical coastal habitats and ecosystems but also the possible benefits of conserving those types of assets as key instruments to advancing adaptation and protection of upland and adjacent areas. We have a few resources listed here uh, to help uh, with this type of valuation, and there's some more on our website. Next slide, please. Grantees should also uh, look at and consider the costs through time to help with financial planning and prioritizing adaptation measures for implementation. Using the maps generated for sea level rise projections in the granted lands areas for 2030, 2050, and 2100, plus a 100-year storm, the grantee can evaluate the direct and indirect economic impacts of permanent inundation as well as temporary flooding by considering, for example, the land value of inundated parcels, loss or impairment of public access points or visitor serving facilities, and loss or impairment of working waterfront facilities. Again, we understand this could be a difficult criteria to meet given limited resources, but we would encourage you to at least make an attempt at qualitative measurements of those projected risks for planning for those planning horizons. Recently, the Center for the Blue Economy produced two studies that may serve as helpful resources for this exercise. They published the Re Regional Economic Vulnerability to Sea Level Rise in San Diego report, which looks at vulnerabilities over similar time frames as well as the report Climate Change Vulnerabilities in the Coastal Mid-Atlantic Region, which contains a similar approach to estimating the economic impacts of sea level rise, but also highlights the financial benefits of natural infrastructure for storm protection and erosion control. Finally, the legislation asks that grantees consider the various costs and benefits of different adaptation options with the idea that this will help grantees select preferred strategies. In addition to considering the costs associated with planning for a particular adaptation strategy, permitting it, the capital and operational costs over the lifetime of the project, um, we highly encourage calculating or estimating the direct and indirect benefits that may be associated with an adaptation project. Those benefits may be the value that is conserved by installing a protective structure in front of or around a vulnerable asset, but could also be value gained by installing a natural infrastructure project that has multiple co-benefits like recreational value or habitat value. Um, 
again, we're going to work hard over the next um, month or two to provide um, more resources and more tools that could help you with this um, part of the criteria on our website over the next month or two, and we'll notify you when those become available. Great. Uh, my name is Carrie Boyle, and I'm with the State Coastal Conservancy, and I'll help provide some examples of how to approach number four, which is a description of how the trustee proposes to protect and preserve resources and structures that would be impacted by sea level rise. Next slide, please. This slide is a broad overview of the different types of sea level rise adaptation strategies. So no intervention is included in the upper left corner. This will likely lead to unacceptable exposure to hazards and impacts to coastal resources. And if a major storm or other disaster occurred, it would place a strain on community resources. So three strategies to avoid this are to protect, accommodate, or retreat. And which method you choose will depend heavily on several different factors that are very specific to your location. In the upper right corner, protection strategies employ some sort of engineered structure or other measure to, to defend development or other resources in its current location, oftentimes without changes to the development itself. So these protection strategies can be broadly categorized into hard and soft defensive measures. Hard armoring refers to engineered structures such as seawalls or revetments that defend against coastal hazards like wave impacts, erosion, and flooding. And then soft options refer to living shorelines like beaches, dune systems, and wetlands, which I'll provide examples of in a moment. Accommodation strategies in the lower left corner use methods that modify existing development or design new development to decrease hazard risks and thus increase the resiliency of development. On an individual project scale, this might include flood proofing retrofits, designing structures to be easily moved and relocated, or elevating the structures themselves. On a community scale, accommodation strategies might include land use designations, zoning ordinances, or strategies such as clustering development in less vulnerable areas. Many accommodation options might also be considered protection, so there is some overlap between those two categories. And finally, retreat strategies would relocate or remove existing development out of hazard areas and limit the construction of new development in vulnerable areas. These strategies include land use designations and zoning ordinances, um, an example of this might be an acquisition and buyout program or requiring that new development is re removed once sea level hits a certain point. Next slide, please. Another way to think about these adaptation strategies is this green to gray spectrum, which was developed by a partnership of coastal adaptation entities called SAGE. On the green end of the spectrum are solutions that are nature-based, um, and they're also called natural infrastructure, or we like to call them living shorelines. Um, the OPC sea level rise guidance encourages this, and the Coastal Conservancy is actively involved in supporting these kinds of projects. On the gray end are the hard solutions, which might be the only option in areas with critical or water-dependent infrastructure. Next slide, please. So the type of adaptation that you consider will depend heavily on the habitat type and the local features of your granted lands. So we won't spend too much time diving into each strategy, but we wanted to help frame your thinking and highlight strategies that you might want to consider. So to briefly mention the benefits of incorporating green infrastructure into your adaptation strategies, um, living shorelines provide several physical benefits in that they reduce erosion, accrete sediment, attenuate wave energy, and create habitat for fish and wildlife. They might also provide outdoor recreation or sequester carbon and buffer ocean acidification. Next slide, please. But there are some limitations that you might, um, that exist with living shorelines. Um, you must consider local features, so you can't just put an oyster reef into an area that's not suitable oyster habitat. And it may not be suitable for every site, and permitting can be complicated. But that being said, California has a growing number of living shorelines projects, and I will highlight two of them. Next slide, please. One example is the Upper Newport Bay Living Shoreline Project, and I believe Newport Beach is on the call today, so this map will be familiar to you. The Orange County Coast Keeper restored native oysters and eelgrass to help protect the shoreline, and this was designed to test the effectiveness of oysters and eelgrass in providing those habitat and physical benefits. And it's a great example of the type of demonstration projects that we really encourage more of throughout the state. Next slide, please. Another quick example is the Cardiff State Beach Dune Restoration Project. 
Cardiff Beach is right next to Highway 101 and is vulnerable to present day flooding and ongoing sea level rise. And they are now constructing beach dunes to help provide protection from flooding and installing cobble below the dunes to prevent undermining of the highway itself. So this image is a visualization of what the um, final project will hopefully look like. Next slide, please. And finally, I wanted to bring up the option of living seawalls as you consider these adaptation strategies. So if hard or gray infrastructure is the only option, it can still be designed to provide some habitat benefits that would otherwise be lost in installing traditional hard infrastructure options. And there's a company called E-Concrete that is really on the forefront of this. So that's one more option to consider, and I'd like to end this section by letting you know that if you want to reach out about this or any other living shoreline option, Coastal Conservancy staff can be a resource to you. So please feel free to reach out. And with that, I'll pass it off to Abby. Hi, this is Abby Newman again from State Lands Commission. So it's important to note that no single category or even specific strategy mentioned here should be considered the best option as a general rule. Different types of strategies will be appropriate in different locations and for different hazard management and resource protection goals. Also, the effectiveness of different adaptation strategies will vary both spatial and temporal scales. In some cases, a hybrid approach that uses strategies from multiple categories will be necessary. The suite of strategies chosen may need a change over time to address, address increased sea level rise and associated increase in exposure to hazards as sea level rise exacerbates storm surge and high waves. While there is no standardized metric for analyzing these assessments, we want these submissions to count, and we would like for our grantees to demonstrate that they're thinking about approaches that can be modified or changed based on new sea level rise science and models as they become available. Next slide. If you've already submitted one of these assessments or plans shown on, the slide, um, shown on this slide to one of our partner agencies, there may be components that can be used for your AB 691 submission. However, please only submit materials that have been clipped to the boundary of your granted lands. Flower will now discuss uh, some of the recently added resources to our website. Hi, this is Flower again. We've mentioned a few resources and online tools, and now we'd like to walk you through our website with these and other important links. In this top left corner is the general overview and a link to AB 691. And here is the bill's criteria and assessment prompts from the State Lands Commission. And here is one of the AB 691 submissions. But please note that this submission was created before the update to sea level rise guidance from the OPC Council was actually released. And below that are links to some of the suggested sites that can help you estimate costs associated with sea level rise such as adaptation or relief from damages. And if you'd like to learn more about public trust resources, we've included our link to the public trust page here at the bottom. Moving to the upper right-hand column at the top, here are some links to guidance documents and examples of planning documents that may have components that meet some of AB 691's requirements and some funding resources. Under that is mapping tools and resources. And here are some links to free online mapping tools that were mentioned earlier. And finally, this additional resources for addressing sea level rise link takes you to an expansive list of resources. You'll find more guidance documents such as the Coastal Commission's Residential Adaptation Policy Guidance, as well as the updated Ocean Protection Council's Sea Level Rise Guidance documents here. And also, there's assistance from great websites, such as Adapting to Rising Tides, that was previously mentioned. And if you're interested, there are many other free online mapping tools that can help produce the required maps, as well as other planning documents with components that can satisfy some of the AB 691's requirements.
And my name is Reed Bajano. I'm the Granted Lands Manager here at the State Lands Commission. Um, I work primarily on Granted Lands projects, um, and I serve as the main point of contact um, and important resource for all of the state's uh, grantees of legislative Granted Lands. I know a lot of you on the line have spoken to me before um, about um, jurisdictional questions, um, public trust questions, and things related to the Granted Lands. Um, so if you do have any questions on AB 691, I hope that I can serve as an important resource. Feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email, um, and I can either answer some of the um, questions related to the granted lands or more technical questions related to AB 691. I can um, get um, Marin or Abby involved here at the State Lands Commission. Um, they're great. Their expertise is amazing, um, and they can try to help answer any questions that you may have as you're going, going about um, creating your AB 691 assessment. Thanks so much. And folks, that brings us to the end of the information that we have to provide for you um, for the webinar, but we'd uh, like to open it up for questions. Uh, I don't believe that we've received any written questions yet in the chat box, but feel free to use that, or you may um, just Unmute yourself and uh, ask us a question directly over the line. We do understand that um, we sent it a lot of information, so <laughs> let's see. Um, so a question has come in um, asking if they've prepared um, mapping for slightly different timelines uh, than has been required by the legislation. And uh, I think that the difference between 2060 and 2050, um, as long as you are covering uh, three timelines that match fairly closely, um, I believe that that could uh, satisfy the AB 691 requirement. Um, it's important that you have uh, the end of the century uh, 2100 and the near term at 2030. Um, but between 2050 and 2060, I think that we would be willing to work with you to um, ensure that that does satisfy the requirement. Um, but very important to include the near term at 2030 and the um, end of the century estimates, please. Um, so we have an additional question that's come through. Uh, yes, so um, the question was, uh, when are these assessments due and for what areas? The assessments are due July 1st, 2019 according uh, to the legislation, and uh, the assessments are only meant to cover your granted lands area. Um, and again, if you have any questions about what that specific geographic scope is, Reed can help you identify it. Uh, and that is why um, we do ask that if you're submitting materials from other sea level rise planning documents, that you do uh, clip those materials to the geographic scope of your granted lands area for your AB 691 submission. Uh, you are not required to include adjacent or upland areas or areas outside of the grant. However, um, those areas outside of the grant that are adjacent may be areas that are important for you um, when you're selecting certain adaptation st strategies or approaches uh, that might span sort of larger geographic scopes. And, um, you know, if you find it necessary to include that, we'd like a description of why it's being included and for what purpose. So um, another question that has come in is a list are we able to provide a list of which entities are required to comply by county? Um, and the, the entities that are required to comply are the entities to which the grant is issued. So if the grant is issued to 
For instance, this question I believe is coming from San Mateo County. Um, it's really up to the uh, that jurisdiction internally um, as to which uh, agencies or or uh, institutions within that jurisdiction need to contribute to and, the assessment. And I plan on compiling a list. I'll send it out to everybody on our um, on our mail on our mail email list. Um, and it, I'll provide a list of contacts and all of the grantees that are required to submit an AB 691 assessment. That might be helpful so you can reach out. You can see everybody that's on there and reach out to the grantees in your county um, that are also preparing an assessment. Right. And just as a reminder, the grantees that are required to submit uh, this assessment are grantees who um, on average generate over $250,000 a year in public trust revenues. Um, and so that is that determines who qualifies uh, as an AB 691 required grantee. So the next question has come in about what financial resources are available to assist with preparing these vulnerability assessments. And uh, while State Lands Commission does not have a grant program available, uh, there may be other sources of grants from other places uh, for the purposes of sea level rise planning that you could use to apply um, for this work as well. We will be providing um, more robust information on our website as it becomes available for further um, funding resources. And I would say some of our partner agencies on the um, line here may be a good source um, for funding, and we will do our best to keep those resources updated on the website. Um, we intend to uh, dig into this a bit more and provide some further resources in the coming weeks, and we will also notify all the grantees as those resources become available in the form of sort of, you know, a, a blast email or a, a grantee-wide notification list. Um, another question has come in, will we be adding any smaller city sea level rise assessments to the website? Yes. So we really appreciate your patience with us as we are working hard to build up the resources available on the website. Again, we will work over the next coming weeks and months to um, provide a broader range of assessments that correspond to sort of a broader range of geographic scopes and, and grantee sizes. So we do um, hope to have up there in the coming weeks um, some assessments that correspond to smaller jurisdictions and harbors. A question is coming about who is the contact um, for the living seawalls? work, and I'll throw that question over to Carrie Boyle from the Coastal Conservancy. Carrie, could you pr provide that information? Sure. I had responded. I wrote down my email in that chat box. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, there are a couple of Coastal Conservancy staff that are trying to scope out projects for this, and the company that I mentioned was eConcrete. And we have some examples on their website. Great. And we can provide, we'll be providing a, a full contact list um, for folks after the webinar of all of the folks who have um, been on the line uh, from our working group. So Carrie's information will be, um, will be there. Uh, another question has come in about um, whether or not the deadline is going to be moved back. Um, and whether or not there'll be further grant funds available for the assessment. The deadline uh, is a, a component of the legislation that was passed. We as a state agency don't have the ability to change that. We, we can't really change the deadline um, because it's tied to a specific piece of legislation and that has been passed into law. Um, but we do want to act as a helpful resource for you. Um, we do want to, you know, be considerate of the limited time and resources that takes or that you have in which to do this. Um, and so we'll do our best to work with you 
um, to help you to meet the deadline. Um, as well as, as far as um, more funding that becomes available, we are going to work to update you um, to the best of our ability as new funding um, becomes available for these assessments. So uh, I think this will be one of our final questions. We have a, a long question that's come in. Uh, sorry, let me just take a moment to read through this. So we assume that the mitigations proposed based on qualitative measurements contained in the report will be non-binding since they are not currently anticipated in any development plan. Yes, so um, these assessments are, are not tied to a specific regulatory requirement or to specific obligations um, for necessarily for you know, state lands commission lease. Um, however, you know, you might have those obligations and responsibilities that are required as part of other sea level rise planning processes. Um, but uh, what we're really looking for in these assessments is to begin to understand what types of adaptation approaches you are considering to maximize the protection and enhancement of public trust resources. Um, and so uh, they, for the AB 691 submissions, they are not um, tied specifically to uh, um, an obligation or responsibility beyond uh, what is contained within the law. And um, I just wanted to mention uh, quickly before we go, if there aren't any other questions, um, and please feel free to email us or call us at any time with questions as they arrive. Um, but we do plan to after the submissions um, are all received, uh, State Lands Commission plans to have a consultant that can come on board to help us evaluate uh, the information within the submissions to help inform the state um, on developing the appropriate um, support mechanisms for adaptation implementation, uh, as well as have a, a better handle sort of statewide on the most high priority um, vulnerabilities uh, and challenges that uh, local jurisdictions are experiencing, as well as um, the preferred adaptation strategies and approaches that are being considered for implementation uh, so that the state um, can again uh, uh, support those efforts. So that will be something that we will keep grantees informed about as we uh, get closer to the submission date. So I believe that we have um, covered all of the questions asked. We, again, will be providing more and more information through our website and through um, uh, directly to you um, through emails. Please get in touch with us with further questions. Um, and thank you all very much for joining us today and for your time.